Um, I hate to break up converse, good, good conversation, but in fact, that seems to be the job that Michael and I have been doing all day long. Um, as soon as we get involved in a good conversation, the timekeepers here have to say, well, it's time to move on. Um, in a way, I apologize for that. In another way, I simply take that as a sign of how smart Michael and I were in choosing the speakers uh, that we've had here, because every one of the presentations um, has been first rate. Um, in a moment, I'm going to introduce a member of the Wilson Center family who will, in turn, introduce um, our keynote speaker today. Um, before doing so, however, there's uh, one other person um, in the room I'd like to recognize. Um, the Charge d'Affaires of the Pakistan Embassy, Mr. Asad Khan, um, is with us. Um, stated another way, uh, he, he's, he's the de facto uh, ambassador here, and um, he, he's got a lot on his plate. So we're delighted that uh, you were able to spend some time with us today. Uh, I'm now going to turn things over to Bill Milam, who will uh, get us going. Continue eating. Um, my hunch is that uh, there's still additional food out there, and um, maybe uh, during the Q&A session, you can go back out and restock your plates. Uh, but I don't want to keep us from the intellectual nourishment part of this event. Um, so I'm going to turn things over to Bill Milam. As some of you heard me say this morning, Ambassador William Milam is a senior scholar here at the Wilson Center, a retired Foreign Service officer, uh, U.S. Ambassador to Pakistan, uh, as well as to several other countries, um, and one of the South Asian, Asian strengths uh, of the Wilson Center. Uh, Bill will introduce our speaker. Bill, it's yours. Thank you, Bob. Uh, this won't take very long because uh, I think we really want to get to the minister, and uh, you, you don't want to listen to me. At least I don't think you do. But there's a bio of the minister uh, in among the things you should have picked up outside the uh, door downstairs on the fifth floor. But you know, uh, and you know from that, that he is the federal minister for planning and development and reforms. Uh, additionally, he's the deputy secretary general of the Pakistan Muslim League, Nawaz. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, an important member of the current government, which has taken office four or five months ago. That's, uh, and he's been a, uh, a long-standing member of, of, that, of the party and uh, is, uh, has held uh, many other positions in the public sector, including Minister of Education and Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission and Chief Coordinator for the Vision 2010 for Pakistan, which is a, a very interesting process. Uh, I asked him uh, what else he wanted me to say, and he said, well, that's, that's about it. Uh, but that isn't about it, I know, but I think I'll, I, I won't say anything more about his bio. But um, he, I asked him what he was going to talk about, and he said, well, uh, of course, the challenges of urbanization in Pakistan, which seems appropriate uh, to this gathering, so I'm glad he is. And before I leave this, I will say, Mr. Minister, uh, we've had a morning, which I think you did not hear uh, completely, which has been absolutely fascinating, full of very, very impressive presentations. Um, not necessarily uh, all, sometimes I think all that hopeful, but perhaps you can add some hope to that. Uh, and with that, I hope you will come to the podium and give, uh, g speak your piece. We will uh, want to adjourn here in about 20 minutes. 40 minutes. Ah, you've got a long, you, I hope you've got a long speech then. Huh? Oh, yes. Uh, there will be a Q&A, Mr. Minister. Uh, we can't do that without a Q&A at, at the Wilson Center. It comes with the, uh, with the, the menu. Uh, but uh, I will moderate that. And if there's a really bad question, I'll rephrase it. Ambassador Milam, Bob, distinguished 
ladies and gentlemen, there are two theories about having someone speak at lunch. Bob is an old friend, and I am inclined to go towards the friendlier theory. The first theory says that if you are enemies with someone, then make him speech, make him speak at lunchtime, because everybody is busy eating, and nobody will follow what the speaker has said. And the friendlier theory says that if you are friends with someone, make his job easy, everybody is eating, and nobody will mind what you have said. So I think that, you know, that's the <laughs> friendlier part of uh, Bob, that he has uh, scheduled me at the lunch uh, speaking engagement. But uh, I will, it's a great uh, pleasure for me to be here at Woodrow Wilson Center. I have been a regular visitor. And uh, I also admire Bob for being very concerned at a time when I used to see him when we were struggling for democracy in Pakistan. And he used to give us at least his moral support at a time when uh, administrations in DC were very much uh, actively supporting dictatorship. And we would uh, tell uh, uh, our friends that, you know, uh, that is going to create problems. And uh, dictatorships cannot create peace or harmony or cannot fight extremism, actually they end up harboring more extremism and more uh, problems. Uh, and we always found a very sympathetic ear uh, in Bob, and he was always very caring also, because at that time we were going through a lot of suffering. Uh, ab agencies would abduct us, they will put us through different uh, tactics, and he was always very uh, uh, you know, concerned about our well-being. So thank you, Bob, and it's again a pleasure to be here at Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, you all have discussed uh, urban challenges, and I would also like to begin with, you know, some uh, data which I think really makes us uh, uh, focus on the challenge of urbanization. Uh, because, you know, this is an age, an era of cities, and it is said that, you know, by 2010, 51% of world population is now living in urban areas and which is expected to go beyond 70% in the next couple of decades. And similarly, the McKinsey's Global Institute has estimated that 50% of global GDP comes from just uh, 362 cities. So that is how cities offer a promise and future. And in case of Pakistan, we find that there are about nine cities which have population of over one million, and uh, 75 cities have a population of over 100,000 uh, in Pakistan. Uh, there were uh, two cities in 1965 which had population of half a million, and today there are 13 cities in Pakistan, more than 13, which have population of more than half a million. So, urban ch challenge or urban uh, uh, sphere of uh, Pakistan's economy has also grown like other uh, urban centers have grown in the global economy. But unfortunately, while urban centers have become catalysts of growth uh, in the world economy in Pakistan, we have seen that they have not done as well for a number of reasons you have seen. So demographically speaking, Pakistan is the fastest urbanizing country in South Asia. Its urban population is expected to equal its uh, uh, rural uh, population uh, very soon. And currently, the urban population contributes about three quarters of Pakistan's GDP. The share of the urban population in GDP has more than doubled between 50s and 2000s. However, I have another angle of looking at urbanization. I don't confine merely to physical space, but would like to draw your attention to wider connotation. In my opinion, cultural urbanization is taking place in Pakistan at a much faster pace than urbanization per se. And I urge and argue that developments in information and technology exposure through media and market development, and particularly distribution channels, 
has transformed many of the rural spaces in Pakistan into virtual cities. The production consumption patterns have changed, rural lifestyle is changing, and so are the behaviors of people. The rise of middle class, exposure to urban lifestyle, emergence of new distribution channels, empowered youth and increasingly rising share of services sector in Pakistan's GDP have changed rural polity. I hail from a rural constituency. 10 years ago, the voters of my constituency used to judge their to-be representatives on the basis of simple criteria. The one who could help in getting their issues resolved in land revenue department and police department. Today, besides these two issues, they would also demand better health facilities, improved services of sanitation, piped drinking water, electrification, supply of natural gas in their village, improved infrastructure, better education for their children, and especially road connectivity. It is not only about their micro level issues, they would also discuss Pakistan's foreign policy, its stance towards drone attacks, perceived level of corruption and inflation, etc. And that is what I call that, you know, in addition to an urban uh, uh, economy, we have an urba rural economy emerging very fast, where in rural spaces, people are increasingly living in a urban lifestyle. When I go to uh, villages in my election campaigns, there is not a single item which is in use in urban lifestyle that is not available in rural areas. So you are presented all the juices, all the beverages, all the uh, tissue boxes, and everything, every element of urban lifestyle is there in the rurals, uh, rural areas and villages. And that is bringing about a very transformational change uh, in the expectations, in the aspirations of the rural population. And at times, I find it very difficult where to draw the line, where urban ends and where rural uh, begins, there because these lines are becoming very blurred. A multinational milk pasturing company collects fresh milk from them, so they are running out of fresh milk and would offer you a cup of tea made up from processed and packaged milk in place of uh, a glass of milk which traditionally used to be part of village hospitality. They would also offer bottled water and box of tissue. I'm quite mindful of the fact that like any other country, inequality does exist in Pakistan too. The picture of rural transformation which I am portraying here may not be a representative picture, especially in some of the more underdeveloped areas in Punjab, Sindh, KPK, and Balochistan. However, emerging middle class is a major game changer, and one can observe certain degree of cultural urbanization in emerging middle class across Pakistan. I would like to address the questions posed to me in the broader connotation of urbanization. And first things first, government's policy on managing urbanization. At Ministry of Planning, Development and Reform, uh, let me say that you know one of the, uh, I think, uh, problems we have faced in the last 14 years, uh, in 98, we initiated Pakistan 2010 program. That was to develop a plan for next 12 years. In 99, when military government came, it discontinued the plan and instead was not even able to offer any five-year, tangible five-year plan to look at the future demands of the country. So largely the country ran for 14 years on year-to-year -year basis. And in this process, an explosion was taking place in our urban cities, in many other areas of Pakistan's economy, but nobody was looking at the demands uh, supply side, you know. We had, after 9-11, our growth rates go up because of very liberal inflows of reserves that created an artificial period of prosperity. Uh, people migrated to cities. There was more consumerism in cities. But then, who is going to provide for energy? Who is going to provide for the infrastructure? And that supply side was missing. And as a result, today, we see that there is breakdown in energy sector, there is breakdown in infrastructure sector, sector, whether it is urban areas or it is overall infrastructure of the economy. In energy, it is very common to believe that you know there is a demand and supply issue, that if we have more supply, we will be able to overcome the energy deficit. 
But to our <laughs> uh, surprise, we found out that during the month of Ramadan, when we were trying to ensure power supply at the times of start of fast and ending of fast, when we put a load of 16,000 megawatts on the system, the transmission system and distribution system was not capable of handling the load, and it will trip down. So there is this bottleneck of the infrastructure because it was not upgraded for new uh, demands. It is not uh, uh, capable of sustaining the new uh, growth levels which we seek. Uh, so the first thing we did was recreated an independent ministry of planning and development and expanded the scope of ministry of planning and development to planning, development, and reform. Because as you know, we live in very challenging times in very fast, dynamic environments. And what can more be illustrative of our times than this piece from the Museum of Smartphones called BlackBerry? Two years ago, it was a market leader, 53%. And today, it is on the brink of bankruptcy. So that is how fast the environment changes. And if we are not able to align our internal responses with these changes, whether these are demographic, whether these are economic, whether these are social, whether these are technological, we run the risk of becoming, becoming redundant. So reform has to become a continuous process in governance. And therefore, Ministry of Planning, Development, role was expanded to be planning development and reform. Yes, I agree, there is a capacity issue. Uh, there is a serious capacity issue, uh, Dr. Nadeem al was mentioning, but then what do we do? If there is a capacity issue, and if we have to address it, we have to find new, flexible ways of tackling this problem. So what we are trying to do is we are moving towards a more participatory and collaborative mode of planning and development. Where you try to harness the potential, whether it exists in academia or private sector or in diaspora, and create flat structures. Because you know, as you know, that uh, Friedman has said that the world has become flat, so our Planning and our development approach also has to become flat. The whole of Silicon Valley is today investing to create uh, mobile work styles. How can people do multiple tasks, not by going to their offices, by, but maybe wherever they are, and they can do different tasks. So that is the new mode in which we are trying to uh, attract some talent from within the country and outside the country in a virtual setting so that the whole planning process becomes a virtual planning process and we are not constrained by the geographic presence of those experts if they are not willing to join us. I may also say that we have also launched some of the very uh, little off track, but this is our response, how we, should, uh, how we are responding to the capacity issue. We have started a Young Development Fellows Program and I can not tell you what we have found how much talent is there in young Pakistani professionals? Uh, this is a program of fellowship for one year. We are giving them very meager uh, stipend, which is peanuts. But we have found young professionals who are passionate about this country, who are graduates of Harvard University, of Yale, of Carnegie Mellon, of UPenn, of London School of Economics, and top universities and schools from within Pakistan, lums and outside Pakistan who are willing to come and work for one year and give their best shot to making uh, a change or being part of the change in Pakistan. So we have to then, you know, try to create new innovative systems. We have partnership with the Pakistan Business Council and we have asked them to finance salary of seven to eight professionals, which we cannot afford to pay out of government rules. So the private sector must support or sponsor their market-based salary structures, and they will be parked with us, they will work for us. So that will be a one way of attracting talent from the market while we attract them on the market salaries, but government is not paying and we do not come under any 
binding that how have we recruited them because they will be recruited by the Pakistan's premier business council on merit and through a transparent way. So this is how we have to build the governance uh, structures. One of the major problem in our urban management was the 2002 devolution scheme, which was introduced by General Musharraf. And it played havoc with our capacity or governance. What it did was it demoralized the civil service and there was a mass exodus of at least three to 400 very young, bright civil servants who left the civil service of Pakistan and joined World Bank, Asian Development Bank, other banks, because they were totally disillusioned with the reform. And the other thing which this reform did was it clubbed urban and rural centers together. So if I was a Tehsil Nazim, there was no distinction between the urban jurisdiction of my domain and the rural jurisdiction. So I mean, the whole focus on urban issues was lost. So as a result, we had serious capacity issues, uh, devolution was done without catering to the capacity issues at district level. So what we see, I remember in 2002, I wrote an article in, in, in the news in a, a paper that very soon the first victim of this urban uh, uh, areas will be the public health engineering and people will be left without clean drinking water. And within three to four years, we saw total collapse of public health engineering infrastructure because the government had devolved this department without creating any capacity in the districts. So sometimes when you do reforms which are not in the right sequence, which do not have buy-in of all the stakeholders, those reforms play havoc. And that is what happened in 2002 devolution scheme, which was done in Pakistan without buy-in of the civil servants without buy-in of the political parties and without thinking about the sequencing of the reform that if you have to devolve, you also need to create capacities in the local structure so that they can handle the new responsibilities. The result was there was no capacity, the powers were devolved, and we saw gradually breakdown of infrastructure in urban areas. And that has made the whole uh, challenge very uh, complex. So now we are working on Pakistan's vision uh, 2025, a long-term plan to uh, create a roadmap on which, uh, through which how can we uh, uh, not just uh, fix our problems, but also can uh, put Pakistan on a fast growth trajectory. A country which has overwhelming young population, which has a population growth rate of 2%, if it grows at 3 and 3.5%, three and then for sure we are setting it up for a spring revolution in every spring. If we want stability, we have to produce high growth platform for the economy, which is six to seven percent. And if we at least, and if that is the platform we want to set for country, then the urban centers as catalysts, as drivers of growth come in perspective and have a very important role to play. Uh, And emphasis is being laid on slowing down movement from rural to urban uh, migration, as well as coping with the issues of peri-urbanization by providing better civic amenities in rural areas. Because our infrastructure is already overloaded, if we do not block or if we do not control or if we do not check this urban migration from rural areas to urban areas, it's going to become a lot worse. So we also need to create some dynamism in the rural markets through rural enterprise so that there is employability, there are better uh, opportunities of uh, life in rural areas so that we can contain this massive migration towards urban areas which are not capable of even servicing the present load of population. Better livelihood opportunities, better education facilities, better health facilities and better living styles are some of the major triggers behind rural to urban migration. Majority of them would never leave the land of their ancestors if they have better income opportunities, better education and better health facilities around them. We aim to take development to the doorsteps of every Pakistani, irrespective of the fact whether he or she is residing in a village, town, city, or in a metropolitan. They all are Pakistanis and government of Pakistan is bound to provide them a decent life because we already have an inequality and poverty 
uh, along urban and rural areas. So, you know, if we have more inequality, no matter how fast we grow, that's going to create problems down the road. So one of our goals is to create an inclusive growth, not marginalize any community, not marginalize any sector of economy, and how while we focus on some of the fast drivers of growth, which is like urban centers, but at the same to a time, do not marginalize further the rural communities. In practical terms, we would be developing intermediate cities in the peri-urban regions to attract and hold migrating population from rural to urban regions in and around mega cities. Uh, you know, one of the key philosophies given to us in our religion is don't let your cities grow too big. And we see that, you know, when cities were allowed to grow too big without any uh, planning, uh, we have a crisis like what we have in Karachi, that, you know, we have a mega city with no infrastructure, with no governance, and we have all the crimes and all the situation what we see today. A key component in this stage involves reviewing urbanization policies in other countries of the region, especially in China, where such approach of building intermediate cities has met with some success. Realizing that large metropolitan areas in China were no longer capable of absorbing additional migrants from rural China, the government actively pursued the idea of developing new cities as well as upgrading existing small towns to become mid-sized cities with an average population of one million. The focus will be on how to develop and finance new infrastructure in small towns so that they are capable of absorbing migrating populations. We have a vision to provide certain minimum basic facilities across all districts, capitalizing upon this minimum basic, the new elected district government under the local government systems would be able to raise its own revenue and spend it on local development of its respective district. Through collective action, we would be able to halt the changing land use plans where fertile agricultural lands are rapidly turning into peri-urban and urban areas posing a risk to food security and food sovereignty to our 180 plus million inhabitants. In the new local government system, we have made some reforms now and we are hoping that the elections will take place very soon. There is a schedule which has been announced for Sindh end of this month and in Punjab beginning of uh, December and I think other provinces are also making their preparations. So we hope that uh, within next uh, three months there will be local bodies in the country. Uh, we have made some reforms. One, in Punjab, the local government system we have introduced, our party. We have uh, gone back to the old system where there were separate local bodies for urban centers and separate uh, local bodies for rural areas because both rural and urban areas have different sets of problems. And other thing which we have done because there was a capacity issue in the local bodies, we have created a window for professionals and technocrats to become members of the local bodies through reserved seats. Uh, the technocrats will be, who could be doctors, engineers, educationists, town planners, architects, they could become members of the local bodies through indirect election. And that I think will go a long way in bringing quality representation in the local bodies and create that critical mass of uh, people, professionals, who will be able to drive uh, these local bodies more uh, professionally. The rapid urban growth is almost invariably accompanied by congestion, pollution, deficits in the provision of civic services, formation of peri-urban slums, increase in crime rate and urban poverty. The municipal infrastructure of the major cities of Pakistan, such as Lahore, Faisalabad, and Karachi, has far exceeded its carrying capacity as a result of rapid and unchecked population growth. Much of this malaise can be attributed to the development policies based on the uh, silos approach between rural and urban areas as reflected in the division of policies along spatial and sectoral lines, rural development programs and urban management programs. And may, let me uh, say, clarify, that while we also create, again, separate rural and urban uh, uh, local bodies, we are mindful that we cannot allow rural and urban local bodies to again take us back into those silos. There is so much which takes place in the interface of rural and urban 
uh, development. So there uh, will be these coordination mechanisms set up in, under which rural and urban uh, local bodies will interact for cross-cutting uh, reforms and development projects. None of these initiatives has given much, was given much thought to the complex dynamics of rural-urban interactions and, and, and the ways in which urban and rural livelihoods were intertwined. Understanding this nexus and focusing on linkages across space, such as flows of people, goods, revenues, and information, and across sectors, such as urban agriculture and non-farm activities in rural areas, is the basis of our government's policy to manage urbanization. We are aiming to turn challenges of urbanization into opportunities. We want to develop our cities in a manner that curtails unplanned expansion and slum dwellings. And people often say, despite whatever the uh, Islamabad uh, model of development is, but still, nevertheless, that is one uh, city where you can see some orderliness uh, in, uh, or some uh, semblance of planning. It is because Islamabad had a master plan. And although there have been some complaints of deviation, but by and large, they have grown through a master plan. So you see some uh, order in Islamabad's growth. But in other major cities, you know, I tell you, when I was in this ministry in 98, 99, before the military coup, we did a project for urban development. And to my horror, I found out till 99, 98, no major city had a master plan. Even Karachi did not have a master plan. And that is when we asked them to start a master plan so that you know, the whole growth can be uh, under some framework. So this unplanned growth is largely responsible for all the problems we have in our uh, cities. So we are updating and upgrading the master plans of 10 largest cities of Pakistan so that we can grow uh, according to a roadmap. And uh, we have set up urban planning units uh, in Punjab, the urban planning unit is uh, um, uh, using the new technology to uh, do town planning and urban planning uh, 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 on more professional and modern uh, basis. And that also gives us a lot of insight into land use and other uh, issues of uh, infrastructure development in urban areas. An argument is made that Pakistan's urban expansion is mostly lateral, which has spatial limitations, so it has to grow vertically. I do buy this argument, but I think we have to also see the context. Energy deficit is our major worry and concern because Pakistan is in extreme weather conditions. How can you build 20-story buildings when you don't have electricity to run the elevators or you don't have electricity to run air conditioning or heating systems. So in the absence of uh, electricity or in the absence of uh, power, I mean, you know, if you construct those 10, 20 storied buildings, they will only become monuments of your energy crisis uh, where they will remain inhabited, uh, unoccupied. Uh, uh, and I don't think that anybody would like to uh, live in those ovens, you know, without uh, air conditioning with 20, at 20th floor uh, with heat at 40, 45 degrees centigrade. So therefore, even, you know, if we have to look for uh, vertical development, uh, the impediment to vertical imp uh, development is energy. So energy is what is holding our urban development, is holding our uh, economic development, and has a cost of two to three percent. You know, uh, by two to three percent of growth rate is uh, suppressed because of this uh, energy crisis. Then energy reminds me of our fuel imports, which may be drastically reduced if we have efficient mass transit system in urban areas. Like all other mega cities of the world, most of our large cities are without any mass transit projects and are facing huge traffic congestion and carbon emission from vehicles contributing to air pollution and ozone depletion. This has turned worst in the absence, uh, this has turned worst in the absence of mass transit. And during the previous stint of PMLN government in Punjab, we took an innovative step and in a record period, our provincial government introduced country's first mass transit metro bus project in Lahore. And it has had a profound impact on the city of Lahore. And you know the whole driving experience 
has changed on some of the major roads where the project has been able to cut down congestion very drastically. The travel time has become more predictable and many factory owners and uh, businessmen have told me that how their whole work is transformed because their workforce, which used to previously take two hours or three hours, sometimes uh, late by three hours or four hours by traffic congestion, can be at work exactly in a very predictable 20 or 30 minute journey. So they're always in time and their work productivity has increased uh, greatly. So this is how what we are hoping uh, that our vision of managing urbanization in cities with efficient mass transit system is to uh, take this further and uh, now uh, we are planning to introduce metro bus and mass transit projects in all major cities, especially in Karachi, Faisalabad, Peshawar and Rawalpindi, Islamabad. Besides mass transit system, the federal government also believes in facilitating provinces towards urban and city specific commercial reforms because urban management is a provincial subject and we have to understand in Pakistan after 18th amendment, the whole uh, context of economic planning has changed. Uh, now provinces have more resources and they have more responsibilities. Urban development comes within the jurisdiction of provinces. However, we feel that if it has, the subject has been devolved, that does not take away the role from the federal government to play the role of a facilitator or a coordinator. Because if federal government did not coordinate with the provinces, we run the risk that devolution is going to further increase inequalities between the provinces. The provinces with better capacity will grow much faster, and the provinces with lesser capacity are going to be left behind. So we have a role to coordinate with the provinces where we, uh, in, uh, we facilitate sharing of best practices amongst provinces, and we sort of create a setting where provinces compete with each other on service delivery and better facilities for the citizens. One of the key examples of this has been observed in the past three years whereby the government of Punjab has initiated automation of land records, reform of zoning and building regulations, and amendments to agriculture, marketing, produce act, which in the past used to hinder with rightful access of farmers to urban agriculture markets. Uh, the land record uh, computerization is another very significant uh, 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 intervention which we have made and we intend to take it to all provinces uh, in partnership with the provinces because you know there is this uh, so there are so many studies which show that when you give people right of ownership of their property and if they have lawful legal documents that economically empowers them and enables their entrepreneurship to come out much more uh, faster. So the link between your property ownership and your economic contribution uh, is one of the very strong correlations. And I think this uh, uh, land record computerization pro project is going to be a very major step in that direction. We believe that urban markets where the act of exchange takes place is a value provider for rural farm and non-farm entrepreneurs and help towards a balanced growth across the country while also producing uh, affordable prices to the residents in the urban areas. We are also mindful that supplementary reform of labor and capital markets are important in retaining people's energies in cities. In order to do so, we have demonstrated during our five-year tenure in Punjab that there is a need to revisit the role of state as a service provider. It is in the same spirit our government has allocated uh, funds for low-cost housing schemes in its federal budget after coming into power in May, 19, May 2013 election. And now federal government is uh, trying to uh, do uh, development in suburban areas and provide low-cost housing in the cities, not just to uh, provide better facilities to residents, but also as a means of jump-starting the economy through construction industry. Ministry of Planning, Development and Reforms is actively working with other federal entities in order to plan and coordinate uh, these uh, projects as part of the implementation process of Vision 2025. And in order to ensure needs of an urbanizing Pakistan, our ministry is working in close coordination with ministries of housing works, interprovincial coordination, national food security and climate change divisions. 
The vision 2025 is based on seven pillars, and that is a framework with which we are going to uh, address the issue of urban development as well as the rural development. And the seven pillars are, one, energy security through an integrated policy. Without energy, there can neither be urban development nor there can be rural development. So our number one priority is to focus on energy, provide energy. If you don't have energy, it's like having a BMW standing outside your house and you have no fuel to run it. So you can have a good look at it, but you cannot drive it. So right now, lack of energy is hindering our economic potential, the potential of growth in the cities. The cranes will not come up unless there is energy. And unfortunately, energy is not there because in last 14 years, the thinking or uh, planning was not done that what will it take to sustain our growth in future and what should we do now in order to support energy in future. So now we have decided that we will look beyond 2013 and look up to 2025 and see that what are our energy needs and how can we not only meet our today's needs but also tomorrow's needs. Secondly, creating a modern infrastructure. Now, our present infrastructure is not capable of sustaining growth rates. Uh, uh, you know, as I said, our, we have the bottlenecks in power sector, we have bottlenecks in transportation sector, our roads, our rails, uh, our ports, everything is very much a bottleneck to support higher levels of growth. So we need to upgrade our uh, infrastructure in cities and uh, in the country. That's our second priority. Three, resource mobilization. You cannot fuel growth if you do not have your domestic resource base. Unfortunately, in 1999, we left 13.5% of tax to GDP ratio. Today, it is down to 9% of tax to GDP ratio. If you don't have your domestic resources, you cannot fuel growth on borrowed money. There has to be generation of domestic resources to build this new infrastructure, to build for the new development projects which we think there should be uh, out there. So we are therefore focusing on tax reform so that we take back our tax to GDP ratio to 13 to 14%. We are focusing on science, technology, and innovation so that we create more uh, endogenous drivers of uh, growth and we are focusing on export sector-led growth, which will be through a cottage industry in the cities, and that will also help us revive the urban uh, uh, growth. Number three, we are uh, moving our, uh, we, we want to move down the value chain from low value to high value, and that requires creating technology triangles. Technology triangles between public sector, private sector, and research and academia. Over the last 10, 15 years, one thing nice which has happened in Pakistan, and again, you know, I would not uh, hesitate to say that I feel uh, very happy that in 98 through Vision 2010, we laid the foundations of this intervention in Pakistan's higher education program where we started uh, a very massive uh, intervention to upgrade Pakistan's competence in higher education through PhD programs in the foreign universities and indigenous PhD programs. And we allocated very sizable funds. And the good thing was that through Dr. Atau Rahman, who was my team member in this project, when he became Minister for Science and Technology, we had continuity. So he continued this program. And the result is today, Pakistani universities have a major uh, robustness in terms of new manpower, in terms of uh, uh, these new young researchers who are out there and now returning from overseas universities, best universities, and some are product of local universities, and who are now trying to do research in our own problems. So how do we create research, private sector, and government triangle as a collaborative uh, uh, arrangement for future development of uh, our export sector and our economy is very critical. And that is the mode in which we are trying to uh, um, uh, go forward. Then building social capital and human capital. In one, uh, one of the, you know, in cities it was amazing that we found out that we build new localities, 
And everybody thought that in these new localities, there will be rich and affluent who will live. So they did not provide any space for government schools. So we have huge settlements. You know, if you go in Lahore, start from Faisal Town, Johor Town, from, for those of you who know Lahore, there are huge settlements, not a single government school. So they assume that all of the children from these areas are going to go to grammar schools and city schools, but where will the children of the house servants or uh, some other poor people living in those areas will go was nobody's business. So, and then we have a problem that, you know, because these plots were not allocated, so when government cannot buy uh, housing, uh, in housing schemes, plots for educational institutions on marketplaces. So we are now making uh, an arrangement whereby uh, government will be able to enforce certain conditions on these private housing societies and also the government housing societies where there will be a mandatory provision of government health and education facilities so that we can cater to all sections of our uh, society. So education and health care uh, will be a major investment uh, for, and priority for us to create growth. Because in the past we had this hardware a driven approach towards development. You know, create high rises, create br brick and mortar, and that's symbol of development. That's half of the story. You know, there has to be enterprise in people. There has to be a work ethic in the people. There has to be the right skills. There has to be right education. It is the software, the human face. It is the human uh, genius which actually becomes the power to turn that hardware into real value. Uh, if computers don't have the Software, they are just worth the sheet metal and plastic that goes into it. So we are trying to bring that focus back on education, on social and human capital, and how can we create communities, peaceful communities in cities, and how can we learn from Karachi? And we do not let a repeat of Karachi take place in other major uh, growing cities of Lahore and Faisalabad and Rawalpindi, which are expanding so that we can avoid the pitfalls of uh, a lack of planning and growth uh, uh, in K Karachi, and uh, how can we isolate, uh, insulate these new urban cities are one of our priorities. So I think, you know, uh, how much time is left? Five more minutes. So, you know, I would like to then say that, uh, uh, touch upon two unique dimensions of uh, urbanization. Uh, which merit further deliberation in Pakistani context and would be an important component of our vision 2025. First, as I said before, uh, try to uh, streamline rural to urban migration in Pakistan, predominantly involving men who first migrate to cities searching for employment. Years, sometimes decades later, they become financially secure and then have the rest of the family relocate to cities. During the initial stages, women stay behind in villages, uh, attending to family, land, and cattle. Thus, urbanization in Pakistan poses unique gender-based challenges, which result from the segregation of the basic family unit. Our government is focusing on gender-based dynamics of urbanization with a focus on the challenges faced by women left behind in villages with additional maintenance burdens. Mindful of this fact, we are planning to initiate special sports schemes for rural women, especially to meet their health and dietary needs through strengthening lady health workers and model health unit schemes. Second unique dimension of urbanization in Pakistan is the role of internally displaced people. While the economic determinants of urbanization have been studied in considerable detail, the impact of internally displaced people on urbanization, especially when the internally displaced are not repatriated to their rural communities years later, has not been fully explored or understood. In 2009, Pakistan recorded the highest number of internally displaced people, that over three million individuals. A large number of those were displaced had to leave their homes because of the terrorist violence and the government's response against the perpetrators of violence. In addition, Natural disasters such as earthquake in 2005 and the floods in 2010 also displaced millions of Pakistanis. We want to focus on hitherto uh, ignored role of internally displaced individuals who 
migrate in a large numbers in a small period of time to urban areas resulting in demand shocks for shelter water food security waste management health schooling and jobs the challenges and opportunities of urbanization are numerous and one can talk about them for hours but i am quite mindful of paucity of time and would quickly touch upon next question which is extremely interesting in the context of pakistan whether it is possible or feasible to build political constituencies in pakistan on behalf of a more forward leaning approach to anticipating and mitigating the urban challenges pakistan will face in the coming decades i am a firm believer that both urban as well as rural areas in pakistan no longer function as mere space of settlement production and service they now profoundly shape and influence social and political relations at every level determining advances and setbacks in mode of production and providing new contents to norms culture and politics however the growth the growing population of cities especially in cities like karachi home to 15 to 20 million people because we still have a census to take place and then only we would know the accurate figure Lahore home to more than 10 million people Faisalabad and few other others which would soon touch 10 million population mean that these cities can shape the national political agenda having realized the importance of cities and political landscape we cannot say that political constituencies are being organized around the rural urban divide the mainstream parties which can reach the voters across Pakistan like PMLN can manage to get their candidates elected both from rural as well as from urban constituencies it is important therefore that utmost effort should be done by parties in power to bridge the various divides between haves and have nots across rural and urban areas the urban and rural divide in sindh has a different context that is more on ethnic basis rather than urban or rural divide in the end i wish to thank the woodrow wilson center for taking such an important initiative and bringing pakistan's important issues like urbanization on the forefront our government uh, is you know uh, very committed to developing the fullest potential of our urban centers and also to listening from national as well as international think tanks and research community and uh, we very much would like to strengthen these linkages because as i said the model the course of action for us for future is developing a triangle of public private sector and research and academia so the knowledge has to constantly drive into our policies and into implementation one of the challenges we face which in the words of uh, a harvard professor is that a sick organization has a huge knowing doing gap you know you know a lot of things but you do a very poor job of implementing them so we have to bridge this knowing doing gap and with the help of uh, uh, think tanks like woodrow wilson center and other research institutions uh, we want to uh, have feedback which will enable us to port this knowledge into practice if the knowledge is not put into practice its value is lost uh, the prime minister of pakistan has already approved setting up a high power advisory committee for our ministry of planning development and reform comprising of members of think tanks and academic research institutions and i have realized that most of the members of our advisory committee have delivered lectures at woodrow wilson center which reflects the importance of the center as well as the academic credibility of the thinking community to whom we are reaching out for their situation analysis and global stock of lessons learned so ladies and gentlemen a planet free from hunger poverty fear of war terrorism coercion and needs is uh, possible however to reach there we would have to start with a society free of all of the above mentioned malaise i am hopeful that together we can work for sustainable societies countries regions and planet thank you once again for your attention so i take questions here ha huh? yeah yeah i can take three four questions three questions yeah I'm going to follow my instructions, although I'm not known for doing that. Three questions. Uh, there's a uh, Marvin Weinbaum over there. Oh, wait a minute. I think there's a. Hold it. I think there's a microphone coming your way. 
Is there, have I got a question on this side in the meantime? Uh, you've answered all their questions to the right, Mr. Minister. Uh, go ahead, Marvin. Wonderful to have you here. Uh, historically, one of the manifestations of urbanization has been that population, population, the rate of population growth declines. It's often said that Pakistan is, has not followed that phenomenon as other countries have. Now, uh, Minister, you've spoken a great deal here about uh, planning on so many fronts, but the one area which you've not touched on is family planning. And one has to ask whether so much of what you are intending to do is not, after all, undermined by that fact. Yeah, that's a very important area. And uh, again, this is an area which is not devolved to the provinces. And, you know, but still, it is not an area of which we can, as I said, in many of the social area responsibilities which have gone to the provinces, we cannot say that we have no responsibility. Because overall, if population growth rates are not checked, they have a direct bearing on our development strategy. So we are promoting, we are pushing population control programs along with the traditional population programs. What you know, I can safely say that the strongest correlation and the most effective program of population control is promoting education in the girls. An educated mother has a planned family. And if you look at the large families, it is mostly with uneducated mothers. So therefore, I mean, while we do our uh, traditional population planning programs, we are very actively promoting uh, education of girls to bridge the gender gap which exists in education sector. And I think through these multi, this multi-pronged approach, we should be able to control it. We have made some progress. You know, uh, 20 years ago, it used to be 2.93%. It has come down from there to about 2%. And now there are also strong economic pressures which are uh, working actually both ways. In certain areas, they are forcing people to go for smaller families. And in certain poverty circles, they actually become an incentive for families to have larger families because they have free labor on their fields or in their settings. So it is quite a complex challenge, but we are committed and we want to bring it further down. Uh, I'm looking for people who haven't asked questions before. I see a gentleman way over there in the back. Um, you talked about uh, Musharraf's uh, system, local body system, but your, uh, your party, Pakistan Muslim League, did not conduct the local body's elections for the last, I think, more than seven years. So the people were deprived of local bodies. Why? And second, you talked about urban migration. As I know, PMLN is, PMLN is a party of big cities. And you have more focus about Lahore, Faisalabad, big cities. And you never facilitated the people of far, far off areas. Why? I think the first uh, question, local bodies, uh, it is important to have this clarification that we have always held local bodies elections previously in both tenures where we were in office. This time the delay in local body election was because there was a consensus among all political actors that we need to change the system. And the previous system had a constitutional protection till 2010. And after it was finished, then under 18th Amendment the responsibility and onus for holding of elections shifted from provinces to the Election Commission of Pakistan. An Election of Commission of Pakistan was given the responsibility for developing new electoral roles. If we had local bodies elections under a different electoral role, and later on had national elections on a different electoral role, that would have been very controversial because some opposition parties were challenging the electoral roles in under which 2008 elections were held. So as soon as election commission finished its electoral roles, there was time for the national election. Then I think the right sequence is also to have local bodies come, election come immediately following 
the general elections. Because there is this debate also in the country that local bodies sometimes are used to influence the general elections. And then that way there is no ownership of this local body system in the country from the new governments which come later on. So I think now we are following the right sequence that there is a general election and now local bodies election will take place and the terms of the office will almost expire together because in the local body system we have enacted, we have put in this clause that it is either a five-year term or a general election, whichever comes first, the local bodies will be dissolved. So that you know people cannot complain that local bodies have been used for political advantage in the general elections. And uh, our party has both rural and urban uh, mandate. I, I think uh, if you look at our uh, uh, success in this election, probably we have more seats from the rural areas and I represent a very typical rural constituency. <laughs> You don't look like a farmer, though. <laughs> <laughs> Last question, right here. I think we should have some uh, gender balance in the questions. Gender balance, yeah, but okay. La ladies, is, are there any ladies? Yeah, yes, okay, no, 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 she, she no, no, look at the, no, here's one over here. This will be Thanks the last for the question. Balance. Go ahead. I'm just concerned about uh, crime and violence because recently, when I visited Pakistan, I was really concerned about my own safety, and it's really surprising because you see the population very vulnerable, and I'm just surprised that nobody has mentioned crime and violence, which would really have a strong bearing on your urban, um, you know, urban social capital or you know the life you're uh, you know planning or envisioning. Well, uh, there are different, uh, again, aspects to it. One, there is Karachi, which has a very uh, sig uh, peculiar significance. Uh, Karachi was hostage to violence for many years because the state was not functioning there. Uh, somehow, all the coalition partners were protecting their kinds of people. So, you know, there was free for all thing. But now, we have taken everybody on board, all political parties, civil society, businessmen. And in Karachi, you see a continuous security operation against these mafias, criminals, and we have also changed the laws, uh, made special provisions for protection of judges and witnesses so that we can bring these uh, criminals and terrorists to law and we can you know, punish them. Uh, that is now beginning to show some improvement. This is the feedback we get from Karachi. In other cities, because of the, I think, breakdown of economy, uh, there is also a rapid increase in street crime because of the large scale unemployment, and that is also a contributor. The third is the capacity of our security institutions. We are now developing model police stations, trying to develop better capacity of police, and, in, and introducing camera surveillance in cities, which will, I think, greatly help us to improve the security situation. And one last question to balance the gender thing. I use my uh, speaker prerogative. You have <laughs> more than that. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have one, I have four questions for you. <laughs> no, one. <laughs> First of all, let me say that we missed you in our advisory committee meeting. Probably you came uh, America America a little early, so I hope that you are there in the next meeting. So I mean, this is to show that, you know, the advisory committee we have set up, we have these people from civil society, academia, uh, private sector, and we want this uh, collaborative uh, economic management in the country. You have, you know, touched upon a very important aspect of devolution. 
Unfortunately, the devolution was done in the right spirit, but its implementation was hurried. It was done very hurriedly. And they did not cater for some of the linkages which should have been provided in order for this devolution to work. And now people are realizing the gaps. And I think uh, the first thing is to start with some kind of uh, coordination. And I have found that you know uh, when a ministry which has been devolved calls the provinces back, for example, if it is health, calling the health departments back to health ministry, their antennas go up. What is it? Are they taking back? Why are they calling us? But we have found that in our ministry, we have this unique advantage that we can call Federal Ministry of Health and the provinces and uh, co coordinate many of these issues on regulation and some of the other uh, standards which need to go into uh, managing these areas. So they come without any hesitation and they are too willing to come. So this is one of the roles we hope that planning ministry will perform under its mandate for reforms, that we take the devolution scheme to the next level and where we plug the gaps which there are in terms of uh, its uh, uh, implementation and in terms of uh, some of the regulatory and uh, uh, coordination mechanisms. Okay. Uh, Mr. Minister, we thank you. Um, it's a great honor to host you. I wish, I, I know you have to leave. I wish you could stay for the following reason. There's been a number of references that a lot of this morning's uh, commentary was pretty pessimistic. Well, this afternoon, immediately, we're going into a session titled Private Sector Solutions. Um, so I think we'll be looking at the opposite side of the just, coin. Just, you know, <laughs> through this pessimism, just two minutes. Listen, Pakistan should be seen from the prism not of the weather factors but of the climatic factors. Any system is judged on its health on climatic factor and weather factor. You can catch influenza, which is a weather factor. You know, you can be knocked down with influenza, you are sick to the bed, you feel terrible, but influenza will be gone, you'll be back up and kicking. But if, God forbid, one has a terminal illness, that is a cause of concern. Now, then you are gone. So if you look in Pakistan, all the climatic factors which relate to health of the ecosystem, most of them are on a very positive trajectory. We have seen that the rule of law movement has gained strength, and it is on an ascendancy path. Judiciary is becoming more and more independent. Rule of law is, uh, is exerting itself. Two, there is growing consensus on constitutionalism. Failing societies have discord and conflict on constitutionalism. We have done it with consensus. Three, political actors are showing signs of maturity. They are co collaborating and competing simultaneously. This is what we call in business and management a mature industry where Pepsi Cola and Coke can fiercely compete with each other on market share, but when it comes to the industry share of cola industry, they have the capability to collaborate. So political actors in Pakistan have competed and collaborated simultaneously. That shows a very healthy sign. We have a growing consensus on the direction of the state that military has no business. We need to pursue peace with India. We need to have friendships with Afghanistan, and we, know, we need no kind of uh, interference in Afghanistan. Let Afghanistanis decide what, they is what is best for their country. So this kind of consensus is a very positive sign. Fourth, a growing freedom of expression. I have not seen a society fail where the freedom of expression is on ascendancy path. Every attack on media by any force of status quo actually ends up giving more power to media rather than reversing the freedom of media. And fifth, a growing civil society, a growing, engaging citizenry of Pakistan, which is becoming ever more engaged with how the affairs of the state are run. Now, these are all signs of an ecosystem, of a climate, which has a promising future. We had bad weather patch with previous government's performance, and hopefully, we ho look forward to making a difference by bringing good governance, transparency, and better economic performance, and to align the weather factors with the climatic factors so that we can create the kind of synergy which a nation needs to go on a fast-paced development. So that much for pessimism. <laughs> uh, 
that's a good note on which to conclude this session. Um, we have two very good speakers in the next session, and I'd like to encourage everybody to move smartly down to back to where we were on the fifth floor, because Kerm Hussein is going to call that meeting together in six, to six minutes. <laughs>